<laughs> All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. Welcome, welcome. This is my favorite part where the people just show yeah. up. Yeah. They're shooting out of a cannon, just like you, Greg. All right, we'll get it. Uh, give it just a minute for everyone to get logged in. I'm Katrina McAfee. I'm the Director of Growth Marketing here at Association Analytics. Uh, while we are waiting, um, we may have used this fun question last year, but that's fine because it's always fun. Uh, what is your favorite holiday movie? Throw that into the chat. Um, we can see there's there's always a few that are common that show up. Uh, yep, Elf. I was gonna say my, I'm tied between Elf, Christmas Story, Christmas Vacation. Got to watch those every year. Oh, Got to have John McLean. Greg's top, top movie there. in my world there, and I also found out Eddie Murphy's got a new uh, holiday movie coming out. I'm excited to see that. <clears throat> Muffins. It's Carol. It's a wonderful life. Elf. I feel like Elf's winning. So Elf's far. good. That's I'm not. Well, that's that's lazy though. I mean, Elf is very good. That's for sure. Great movie. Why it's is not, that lazy? I'd in the summertime, and be happy about Elf. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. true. <clears throat> weird that I love. Some of the movies. All right. Interesting. Does anyone watch the Hallmark Christmas movies? I have a my cousin's husband's obsessed with them and watches them all year, and it's a joke in our family. <laughs> yeah. You say Hallmark movies. Yeah, like yeah. Christmas Hallmark movies. Yeah, my wife too. Doesn't have to be Christmas. Anything Hallmark, she loves it. Oh, okay. She she realizes how bad they are, but she likes to watch them anyway. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let's see what are we have to do. It's Wonderful Life. Yeah. Christmas Vacation. Yeah. I feel like there's a. No one has said Die Hard though. I don't think. I think Greg did. Didn't just me. No. Just me. Well, just you. But I mean, in chat. <laughs> All right. Carl Winslow's in it. Like, what? Come on. There's a sequel you can watch. Also, a Christmas movie. All right. I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, thanks again for joining us, everyone. I'm Katrina McAfee. I'm the director of growth marketing here at Association Analytics. This is our analytics and action series. This is the last of the year, um, so we got lots of good stuff coming your way. Uh, your speakers are, drum roll. Bill Comforti, SVP of Strategy and Solutions at Association Analytics. Greg Pollock, SVP of Sales and Enablement at Association Analytics. Uh, both of these guys, 20, 30 years experience combined. We don't have to count. Several. Yeah. Um, with um, associations and data and software. So uh, they've got great minds, think alike. We call this uh, series the uh, Bill and Greg Show uh, for a reason. They give lots of great info throughout the year. So we're actually um, in the process of planning next year's series. So be on the lookout for that um, and then enjoy today's topic. And I'll hand it over to Greg, I think. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So we're going to bring in the new year um, with three strategies to elevate your association's impact in 2024. You know this because you read the title. Um, we brainstormed a lot on all of the things that you talked to us about, all of the things we've been hearing we tried to find the three things that we thought were going to be most ubiquitous for everybody. So what's our strategy today? Um, we're in the intro. We're right there now. We're going to move on to our methodology. How do we pick these three things? Why did we pick them? Um, we're going to tell you what they are right here. Um, we're going to ask you lots of questions and get you involved as we go through. And we'll have some key takeaways and wrap ups at the top of the hour. You'll get your credits and lots of knowledge. And we'll have a fantastic webinar with lots of fun. Keep the chat going. If you have questions or comments, throw them in there. Um, if you have a funny joke about anything we're talking about, try and make us laugh as we read the comments as we're trying to present our slides. So who are we? We are Association Analytics. We're a software company exclusively focused on helping associations better love their data. That's key, right? Everything from data governance, data quality, data warehousing, all the way to visualizations and making decisions with your data is what we're all about. Bill, how did we pick these three topics? Ooh. Well, look, I mean, there was uh, a few things to consider. I mean, the, the main one is, is it ubiquitous? Like Greg said, does it apply to almost every association? Uh, you know, we talk with um, with trades, with professional associations, with hybrids, with, you know, big and small, every shape and size. And these are things that come up very frequently in conversation. These are things that we can recommend. Um, and we purposely pick things out that 
can kind of make an impact without a lot of additional effort or resources, right? I mean, we're mid-December now. I mean, budgets are set, you know, resources are set, right? You're probably not going to go out and hire a bunch of people, you know, at the uh, at the end of the year. So we have to do things with our current staff and uh, we want to, uh, so we want to highlight those kinds of things. And the first one, and this was, as a side note, this was a kind of a, an argument, I won't call it an argument, right? But with the marketing team wanted to say what the three things were. I personally didn't want to do that, but we already know what they are, but I'm still going to present each one like it's uh, new. So data collection is, uh, uh, is, the, is the first one. So, um, so Greg, I mean, the uh, data collection is, uh, it's, it's a big one. It's very closely linked, I think, to analytics. It's safe to say that it applies to every single association out there. Definitely comes up a lot. I don't think it's as resource intensive as it might seem or as some of the other things that you might do. Um, so I, I definitely think it fits the methodology, but uh, give us a little bit more insight on why data collection makes sense for today's talk. Data collection can be the big scary Grinch um, until we really look at it and analyze what's going on there. And we realize he's not as scary and as menacing as we thought he was. He's just a misunderstood guy. And I feel like data governance, data collection, um, data quality is a misunderstood beast that's hiding in our uh, in our closet there. So why are we talking about this? Well, people tell me literally three times a day that they have missing data, they have dirty data, and they have incomplete data. And my follow-up question to them, shout out to Wes, is how is this hindering you from making decisions now? And people don't really have a good answer to those questions, right? Um, and then I said, well, what's your strategy and plan to overcome this? And they're like, well, you know, we have a staff member who goes in and clean things up. We're, it's a constant moving target. We're working on it all the time. And I feel like there's a lot of low hanging fruit here on the tree that we can easily pick um, around data governance. Um, if, also, if you go back and watch our data quality webinar, we talk about the fresh start effect. The fresh start effect is all about that idea that if we want to tackle um, a problem, having a fresh start at it is a really important social strategy to get that taken care of. As we move into the new year, let's all commit to each other to take a fresh start on our data governance and our data quality. And we're going to walk you through a few things that you can do pretty easily with the systems and tools and staff you have in place now um, to make a big impact on your opinions of data collection and quality and how those data collection and quality issues affect your ability to make data informed decisions. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, so, look, so we're going to go to our first poll. So uh, get your phones out. If you've done some of these with us before, um, you know that we use a tool called Slido, uh, which allows you to participate in the uh, in the polls uh, via a mobile device. So go ahead and get those out. And also, if you've uh, done some of these with us before, you're probably going to know uh, the answer to this. Our first question, which is the two ways to collect member data are blank and blank. Scan the QR code with your phone if you want, and it'll bring it up right away for you. There you go. Or if you just want to go to the slido.com and type in that number, you can do that as well. Just click right. join event, and then you're in. So we're going to survey and analyze. We're going to guess and assume, monitor and record, demand and infer, ask and observe. I love watching it in real time. Yeah. Are people changing their answers? Are we losing people here? I demanded and inferred. I demand you tell me what your answer is, and I infer my own opinions. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we got, we got some people. I'll give you a few minutes, another few seconds here. Yeah, so one of the... Uh, one of the things I would struggle with, because I, I like to see the bars move while people are uh, are answering, but I do think it influences like people that respond late. I think seeing the bars move uh, influences the choices uh, that you make. Um, okay, so um, over half of us uh, said that survey and analyze is the right answer to this. The two ways to collect member data are survey and analyze. Um, okay, I mean, that's a, that's a good guess. It's not the correct one. It's a good guess. I would say that survey is probably a good way to collect member data. Um, analyze, maybe, right? You have to stretch the, uh, um, the the definition a little bit, but that one is close, right? So uh, the correct answer in 
this is only because this is how we've um, uh, how we've done it many times on the Bill and Greg show before. The correct answer is ask and observe. So congratulations to those that selected ask and observe. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Greg to tell us um, how we ask for the data that we want. Awesome. And if you've got your hand up in the chat, I see you there. Ray, uh, type in the chat what you want to know. Um, and if you don't want to put it in the public chat, feel free to use the Q&A feature and you can ask us a private question. We'll answer it as we go through. No problems. Um, so we want to do this two ways. One is we want to ask tell us the answer to our question. And we can ask this in a number of ways. Um, we're probably already asking this on our join form. We're probably already asking people through surveys. Um, we think about our event registration system. We're asking people things. If you're like me, you get prop fueled all the time. You're getting questions in email. You're getting applications when you're registering for things. We're asking you lots of questions. So I think the number one way that associations rely on data today is they just ask. They allow their members and organizations to tell them the answer and they ask and they they uh, organize it that way. Okay. Uh, yeah, so asking is what we call uh, an explicit uh, uh, data collection method, right? So we're, uh, I ask and you tell me, so I know explicitly, you know, what your preference or what your interest or, or whatever is as it relates to that. So um, as we go into uh, to this next point here, I wanna ask everyone, think about these methods of asking, right? You're, your app, your membership join forms, your surveys, your event registration forms, anywhere where you have a touch point where you ask members for things, what is one question that you could add to one of those forms that would return highly valuable data, right? Just one question, right? Let's, uh, let's start really small. What's one question that you could ask? What's one piece of data that you uh, would like to have, but you don't, and you could, uh, I bet that you could add an additional question without even changing the length, because you probably have a few that you could uh, retire, right? That you're asking that you don't necessarily need to. Jennifer's got a great question there. Is there a rule of thumb for the number of questions to ask on any of these options? My boss is always concerned that we are over asking. Um, I would say that your boss is smart to be concerned about that. And I don't know that there's a, there's a hard and fast rule of thumb. I would say that, um, be very deliberate about it, right? We're gonna get into this down the road, but if you don't, if you can't clearly articulate the reason why you need that information, then don't ask it, right? So it's always a balancing act between the number of questions and the, the user experience, right? In, in, um, in answering those questions and the, the need and the impact of the data, right? But also you can spread it out, right? You don't ask it all at once in one giant survey. There might be multiple opportunities to uh, collect the data um, over, the, uh, over the course of the year. Yeah, right. job job title. Yep. Uh, yeah, Man, separate. A great one. Personal separate, email address. Yeah. Yeah. Separate topic, uh, Kevin. But instead of job title, we highly recommend functional role or similar, or um, you know something like that. Because job titles are too too varied. You know they uh, uh, that's like a free text thing most likely, and uh, um, it's hard to compare, right? If you don't bucket them out and and correct them and so forth. So, so um, you'll find something really important there. I don't think it's about asking too many questions. It's about asking the wrong question the wrong way. If I ask you what your job title is and I have a text box, I'm pretty sure you're gonna use that text box as a merge field in the next email to personalize that email to me. <laughs> um, and you haven't personalized an email. That's uh, not personalization. That's addressing me in the email. Um, if you're gonna ask something like functional job role, so you can determine what products and services someone with my job role is most likely to take advantage of, that is a great question to ask, right? So think to yourself, not like, what question do I want? It's like, what am I going to do with that question? How do I plan on using this? And if I can have a really good answer on why I plan on using this data, yeah, feel free to ask. Yeah. Uh, personal email address, also a really good one, right? It doesn't change. I change jobs. I get a new address. You've lost in touch with me. Get my personal email address, and that's going to um, you know, stick around. So uh, along those lines, here is a great way to boost your data collection by asking, and uh, if you don't get anything else from this webinar, um, this is something that I would highly recommend. Um, so, Greg, what, uh, what about this piece of data? What do we want me? So something that rarely changes? Okay, I, I want yeah. something that doesn't change. That'd be helpful. Yeah, would you, what about something that every member has? Does that, that sound good? It's ubiquitous, every member has it. I want that, yeah. All right. 
What about unique identifiers? That's kind of a problem. We don't always keep our customer ID in every single uh, data source. We need to be able to identify people, right? Even email address, people use like info at something.com or they use the admin's email address, right? Yeah. So that's something that makes data, that, that's not something that really helps with duplicates, I think, that could be unique. All right. And on top of that, it's a great way to inform and engage. That's that's something we want, right? What this are we talking about? This could be a piece of gold. Like if you could figure out what this is, man, this is the one thing I want to start collecting. Yeah. I mean, it's ahead of us here a little bit, right? That cell phone number. Ask for the cell phone number, right? What a great opportunity, even if we're not going to use it to physically call them, great opportunity to create a unique identifier, to track members as they move from one organization to another, as they change jobs and email addresses. That cell phone number is going to stay the same. This is a great way to can create a consistent record um, across a span of number of years with who one person is. Top reason for joining, Nicole, right there. Yep. Uh, yeah, that, that those are good. So, uh, so what else can we do with this, Greg? What about uh, uh, bulk SMS and uh, voicemail drops and stuff? Anybody doing that? Uh, yeah, these are great ways to um, to get in touch with members. I think this voicemail drop is an underutilized one. Not every member wants a phone call from you, but they'll check their voicemail. There's a tool out there called Drop Cowboy, um, and you don't have to have a whole call team that's calling people and talking to them live. You can record one message put it in Drop Cowboy and everybody just gets a voicemail with that one message. Hey, we've been we've been trying to contact you about your um, you know, your car's auto insurance. Um, your warranty's up and we want to <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we want you to know your membership's expired. You probably don't know your member benefits are running out. Um, we've been emailing you. Let us know if we can get a hold of you to renew your membership for us. So cell phone number is huge. Um, texting does work. You want to make sure you're you're following the opt-in. I had somebody tell me they're opting everybody in now. Not that they know what they're going to text, but in the next two or three years, they want to start texting people and they want to start building up that list of opt-ins now mm -hmm. so they have that permission to text them down the road. And then I cool. think there's a lot of mobile apps out there where you can text people, hey, download our mobile app. We want to get connected with you. Click on this link here and you'll be able to download the app for your smartphone. And then we can send you push notifications on a regular basis. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Greg. So um, the other thing I want to say about cell phones is that, well, actually I want to address uh, Dana's comment in the uh, in the chat. Um, you know, so Dana is an expert in uh, in governance, right? And, and data quality. So now she's concerned about being able to validate the cell phone numbers. Uh, valid concern. However, I'm I personally am less concerned about this with cell phone than other pieces of data because it really rarely changes. So once you have it and you get it by asking, and once you've asked me my cell phone number, if you had asked me that, at any time since 1996, you would still have my current uh, cell phone number, uh, which you know, which just uh, uh, does not change. Uh, but the other thing that's good about it is once you get it, and you do have to get opt in in order to be able to uh, to send me a bulk SMS or, or the voicemail drops. But it's a really good way of collecting other data, right? So I would encourage you to research this. I did a little bit, and you can see at the bottom it's a little bit blurry, but this one is from a company called SMS Comparison. Dot com. So, you know, a, a, a small grain of salt with some of the stats that they present here, considering the company name. But here's some of the things they tell us, right? So Americans check their phones 96 times a day. And that I think they, they said something like five and a half hours of time spent on your phone. This one I thought was cool. 95% of text messages are read and responded to within three minutes of being received, right? So if you think about, have you done any of those sort of uh, lag analysis on your emails? It takes a long time you know, um, for um, for people to open emails. And if you look at an average, it's probably like something like 90 minutes or two hours, but that's kind of misleading because a lot of people open it right away and a lot of people don't open it for days and days, right? And so uh, with uh, now with mobile phones, you have a you know, pretty good chance of getting people uh, right away. And then the click-through rate is much higher than other things you're doing, right? So 4% for email and 1% for Facebook, according to this, um, according to this one source, but this kind of rings rings true for me. I mean, think about the ways that um, that texting is used in your life. Like you get it for an appointment confirmation, and right? You have a doctor's appointment and they send you, hey, I'm reminding you of the appointment and click here to confirm. And you'll do that just about every time. And there's a very small chance that you would pick up the phone if they called you to confirm that same appointment, right? You're going to click the link and fill out the the pre-registration paperwork because it's going to save you some time when you get there. Uh, but again, if they if you relied on them to call you to do that, probably not going to get done. Okay, 
Um, so the other way, so we ask lots of different things we can ask about, but we can also observe. So we have all this data, all these touch points uh, that people are making purchases, they're registering for events, they're visiting our website and downloading stuff, their subscription searches. Um, in our community, there's discussions, we, we can uh, we can observe their, their sentiment, right? So all of these are implicit ways that you can um, uh, that you can get at um, the preferences and interests of uh, of your uh, audience, right? Anything to add to that, Greg? Yeah, asking is the worst way to get data. Period. <laughs> Observing is a significantly better way to get data. The data that you're complaining about, that's incomplete, that's missing, that's dirty, that's old and outdated, is the data you're asking. When you observe, you have the same ability to collect that information through observing what these people are doing, right? Somebody here said years in profession. I can observe how many years you're in the profession. I can observe how many years you've been a member. I can observe what type of member you are. I can observe what your title is by putting content out there relevant to specific titles and observing who interacts with it and saying you're interested in that type of content. Furthermore, I would say that people are really bad at self-identifying with what they actually want, right? Think about all those times you've been asked preferences and you fill them out and then you ignore everything you get because it's confirmation bias on what you already wanted to know. I wanna know all those other things that I didn't fill out of my profile. And that is where um, our example from the world is today. So in data, we like to use these proxies. Let's find a proxy for an organization who does a really good job with data and doesn't ask you anything is Amazon, right? So this is my Amazon account. In preparation for this uh, webinar, I spent 10 minutes in Amazon looking for my um, ask questions and I couldn't find them anywhere, right? Because Amazon doesn't ask you demographics. They don't ask you what you're interested in, they observe. And why is this super advantageous? Well, I was in Amazon looking up a specific product. That product has tags. Those tags now relate to me. Those tags are going to inform what products and services I see in Amazon when I go back and what they're retargeting me with across the web. Their ability to observe gives them control. They create the taxonomy. They create how they're going to use it. They can even start adding up. Did Greg look at that one time or five times or 10 times? And then they can put weighting behind those preferences. The ability to observe what people want puts the control back in your hands because you can really configure how those observations work and what we're gonna do with that data that we observe. So if we're gonna have one tip, ask for a cell phone number. If we're gonna have two tips, we'll get to it later. If we're gonna have three tips, <laughs> it's really focus on observing because the observational data is gonna be a lot more valuable for you than the ask data. All right, uh, cool. So Greg's gonna go through uh, a few more tips and, and just sort of broad things about what we should consider when we're doing our data collection. And as he's doing that, I want, I pay attention to Greg, but I want your thoughts on what is this brown guy here? We tried, we talk about whether it kind of looks like a taco or is it, I thought it was maybe a cookie. Uh, and I think Greg said a meatball. So is if anyone like has top of a meatball, is anyone has an idea. Half I don't know what cookie. he is. Okay. Anyway, here are so, data collection tips. Um, be deliberate. Let's go back to our questionnaire. Why are we asking this question? Do we know what we're going to be doing when we get this answer? right? If you can't tell me what you're going to do with that answer, don't ask. Furthermore, if you can't tell me what you're going to do with that answer, like set up a better control that's going to allow you to use that answer. Um, be consistent. If you're going to ask a question, make sure you ask the same type of question and the same type of answers regularly, right? This is our annual survey. You should have control questions you ask year over year, same question, same answer, so we can compare how you're doing in one to the other. Be consistent across departments. If your membership team is asking different demographic questions than your event team is asking different demographics than your email team tags marketing messages, we're not being consistent, right? The same things we agree upon for our demographics should apply across our organization. And this is why we think this is a really good tip for the fresh start effect. We're all moving into the new year. We're all revisiting our plans. Get together as a team and ask yourself, are the things our membership team collects the same things our event team collects? Are those the same taxonomy that our marketing team uses when we send out calls to action? Are we being consistent across the board or are our members completely confused and we're re-asking them the same questions every time, right? 
Here we can do that same thing, make it easy for me. Never make it hard for the participant. If I'm trying to register for that event, don't put 25 questions in front of me before I can click that register button. Ask me after I've registered. Hey, Greg, we saw you registered for this event. We want to personalize your itinerary for you. Can you tell us this stuff now? Right. So don't put unnecessary barriers in front of me and don't have different departments ask me the same question multiple times. People really get frustrated with that. My last tip here is be creative. You don't always have to tell the person exactly why you're asking that question or why you're collecting that data. You can have a lot of fun with this. Um, I was at a, a, a physical event a couple of years ago and the keynote speaker said, I'm going to give my book away for free to everybody who texts this number right now. And he put the number up on the screen. He said, if you text me your name and information, I'll mail you a free copy of my book. And what did everybody in that session do? Everybody took out their phone and everybody texted him and said send because they wanted a free copy of his book. The book was free for everyone who attended. He just wanted your information. I've also been in sessions where people are like, hey, take this free data quiz and you can scan the QR code and you can see how safe your data is. And the first two questions were, who are you and what's your email address, right? So we're doing this sort of like, I'm getting information to give you information, but make it fun for me. Make it something I want to participate in. Don't make it a burden for me. Make it a hurdle that I have to get over to participate. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Um, so the last thing that I want to talk about here is uh, kind of putting together all the things that we talked about before is we should do an audit. Right. And yeah, I like the pack. Plus one for Jennifer there. Love it. Uh, I don't uh, I don't want to make this sound big and, and hairy and you know thinking about uh, tax audits or anything like that, but think about what are your goals, right? Um, these are the questions you should be asked, right? What are my goals? Uh, what's the data going to be used for? To Greg's point before, if we can't really answer that, probably not something that we should collect. Um, I want to work backwards from the analysis, right? It's because the reason I'm collecting the data is because I want to make decisions based on it. So I have to work backwards. Uh, from the types of questions I want to answer and the analyses that I want to do and determine if I have all the data that's necessary for that. If I don't, then I have to see, um, can I observe it? And if I really can't do that, then maybe I move to how can I ask it effectively without annoying people, essentially, right? Um, are the um, are things consistent? Uh, so we talked about that one. Are there unnecessary duplicates or redundancy? Um, what are the opportunities to collect additional data in the current interactions, right? So you have a few ways that you're already interacting with most of your members. Can you discreetly, right, without really degrading the experience too much, add in a few things that are going to get you um, some additional data or maybe sub some things out so you get some uh, more valuable data? Um, is it convenient? Um, and how does how is it going to uh, impact uh, that experience, right? So it has to be easy. It has to be convenient. Um, and we need to ask ourselves if that is the case or not. Okay, uh, so let's go to our second way. Um, drum roll, like you don't know what it's oh, going to be. Wait, we got we got some questions and we have some things to talk about. Yeah, let's do it. Um, first up, I want to I want to highlight this picture we've chosen. AI has generated this picture. Something is wrong in this picture. Tell us in the chat what is wrong with this picture. Um, and as you're looking at that, someone in the Q and A asked us, "Can you talk about demographic collections?" We really want to do this, but we've heard their regulations on what data you can collect. Um, I've already told you why I don't think demographics are the best thing to be collecting, but Bill, are you aware of any regulations on what I'm not allowed to collect? Um, I would say regulations are more like the way that you collect it, like the way that you ask the questions. Probably you're talking about things related to uh, you know, DE, uh, DEI. Yeah, um, type things. So those are things that you want to be careful about. I, I think there are regulations about um, the uh, the uses, right, the, of uh, of the types of data and the types of consent that you have to have. But um, I don't know that uh, I don't know about regulations about things like anything that's broadly considered a demographic, right? That you're not allowed to uh, to ask. So if you if you want to uh, be more specific about that, maybe we can. Uh, Maybe we can address that. The ring binder laptop blows my mind. So there are some regulations you should be aware of. These are primarily around what's called PII, personal identifiable information. And okay. this is where you get your GDPR and your SHIELD Act and your right to be forgotten rules. Um, you're going to have to follow those regardless. When we think about demographics that may be a little bit um, questionable, it typically relates to DE&I. Are you allowed to ask people gender? And if you are, what answers 
are you providing them? Um, if you're going to ask for race, what is in the drop down, and are you being inclusive or over inclusive or not inclusive enough? Um, I think you're going to make people mad regardless of what you do with these. Don't worry about it. Um, and I think you're also going to find that you're never going to get everybody's DEI answers. Um, and this is where analytics is directional, not um, uh, fully flushed out. So if you're only going to get 10% of your members' gender, is that enough to be able to make a decision? Do we have a diverse attendance at our annual conference? So before collecting those, ask yourself, if I only get 20% of people to fill this out, is it really going to help you make a decision? It might. It certainly might. But if it's not, maybe find another way to get that information or um, research what a proxy is and try and find a proxy or a way to observe that information that's going to get you to the same answer. All right. All right. Uh, Item number two. Cool. Let's let's move on. And now we're talking about uh, AI. All right. So don't get too distracted, but you can look um, you can look at this one. There's a, there's a bunch of small uh, mistakes in uh, in this one as well. And so we've talked a lot about AI so far in, in this series, and we're going to continue to do that into next year. A lot of the times it's like, hey, here's some cool stuff you can do with AI or here's some new tools or whatever. We're going to touch on that a little bit. Right. But mostly uh, what I want to talk about today is the the idea of institutional or institutionalized AI. And so right now we're kind of in ad hoc AI, right? Like Greg does some stuff, I do some stuff. We're in experimental AI. It's like, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying stuff out uh, in the evenings or doing personal things or like planning vacations and stuff like that. You know, we're still learning, but we're doing that all on our own. And so what I wanna suggest is that if we all want to make a big impact in 24, and I think that we do, is we have to work on that institutionalized uh, part of it, right? So we have to get uh, the use of AI and AI programs, we have to make sure that they're officially recognized in our associations, that they're even promoted. Uh, we want to more and more start to um, use AI in our jobs with some regularity, right? Um, it's, you know, practical things, right? So we're using it to write our, um, you know, or draft or ideate on our member-facing content um, and plan our events and not just like look for like cocktail recipes and plan, you know, uh, vacation itineraries and stuff like that. Uh, and then we want to try to get it adopted in our organization, right? And we've talked a lot about adoption of analytics, um, but, um, you know, a lot of those things also apply to AI or really anything that you're trying to adopt. But anyway, so um, why should we do all of this stuff, Greg? Um, well, first of all, um, you have to, because people are already using AI. You can't tell them not to use it. It's not going to work. So, you have to go under the impression that you and your staff are going to be using AI, whether you're using it within the policy or you have no policy, that's your choice. If you'd like a good sample of a staff policy, uh, SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management has a sample policy you can adopt um, and make it your own. I would say start there, ask ChatGPT for an AI policy. I bet they've got a good answer too. Um, you don't wanna get left behind. AI is not coming, it's here. And you want to be on board the wave, but you want to be on board in a smart way. You want to be on board in a scalable way. Every member of your organization shouldn't sign up and pay for their own paid account and have their own credits for every AI tool. A lot of these generative tools charge by credits. And if Bill buys an account and Greg buys an account and Katrina buys an account, we're all sort of sitting on all these credits that may or may not get used. Um, we can just have one account for everybody, right? It's also not efficient. If I'm spending an hour researching the best AI tool to help me build a PowerPoint and Bill's spending an hour and finds a completely different tool and uses it in a different way, this isn't really efficient. So we want to start making recommendations. What are the things you want to do with AI and what is the best tool that our association can use and say, this is the tool we're going to use to do this thing with AI. We're going to use this tool to make pictures. We're going to use this tool to come up with ideas. We're going to give data to this tool, and we're not going to give data to that tool. And this is the next one, which is security risks. If you don't have a policy on how to best use AI, someone is going to run a report and copy thousands of rows of rich, valuable information and put it out there into a chatbot. If you wouldn't post something on the public internet, don't put it into a chatbot. It's the same thing. When you put that data into a chatbot, it goes into the model, and other people can access that data. Right? So we know there are massive benefits out there, but we think having a policy that shapes how your team is supposed to do that is a really important starting point right now. 
And I'll also say we're sort of at that like launching phase of the the AI tools. And there's this big sort of dot com bubble down the road that's about to happen. And what I don't want you to do is be the next pets.com where you and your staff invested all of your time into this tool that isn't going to be there in a year. And these newer tools are going to come out. So dip your toe on the water. But I wouldn't say marry yourself to one specific AI tool that's going to solve every problem for you. Start to test lots of different tools out within your policy and figure out the right ones that are for you and how you're supposed to be using them. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Um, okay, right. So we kind of agree, I think, that institutionalizing AI is going to be um, a good thing, you know, for uh, for most organizations. So how do we how do we do that exactly, right? Um, so first one is to identify some some key areas that uh, you can make a big impact with AI, right? So that's your strategy and objectives. Um, to like with governance or like with any kind of adoption thing, if you want to make it institutional there have to be some people that are responsible for it. And ideally it starts at the top. This is something that's kind of, you know, it's it, it really does have to be top down in some ways, right? This policy uh, has to be, uh, you know, uh, senior level uh, people in the organization that are responsible for um, for crafting some of this stuff. So uh, we do need to have, you know, some level of, of participation, right? And like with analytics, we do recommend this cross-functional team, right? So. This one's going to be easy. Uh, everybody's interested in this. Um, it's going to be easy to find a couple of people across different uh, key stakeholder groups that are interested in exploring how AI can help uh, make things uh, easier for you. Um, if rather than uh, having us, um, ha rather than having us go out and uh, learn things on our own, it's going to be much more efficient if you organize the training. Right? You're already learning this stuff anyway, so make it org wide. Um, because this is not only more efficient in terms of the people's time and whatever, but you can also have more of a um, more guidance on on the types of things that uh, people are learning. Right? Um, ethics and privacy. So uh, you're doing this at scale. You know, it's also a risk doing it ad hoc, but doing it at scale means that that there's even more emphasis on things like um, the data privacy parts and the ethics bias and things and using these kind of models. Um, so probably this is something that you'll need to document to a degree. Highly recommend that you uh, crowdsource this, right? I mean, so go into um, forums that you're used to using, ask if other associations um, are doing it. I know that uh, I know that some are. Um, good chance that they'd be willing to to share, you know, those kinds of things at least in a in a template form. Um, down the road, you might consider also doing something like this for your members. This is something that we've talked about. It not only changes how you do your work but it changes how you interact with your members and how they do their work, right? So one of uh, our customers, uh, they're in, in public relations. They just launched a, um, a guide, you know, for applying AI to, uh, to public relations. And it's, it's basically a, a handbook, you know, for their members, you know, being very responsive to something that's current and providing uh, massive value, right. To, uh, to members uh, and starting small, right. Um, Pick one app or one specific business area, and uh, and start there. So uh, one bonus thing is uh, along the start small idea, uh, a show and tell kind of a thing. So this is leaning into the ad hoc stuff a little bit, but this is how you take something that's ad hoc and make it institutional. Is um, who stole this idea from Rob Wenger from Higher Logic? Um, he had something that he called AI October, where he basically invited people to present. The things that they had been doing on their own to the group and um i think there are prizes and it was kind of gamified so the ones that came up with the best ideas that made things most uh op you know that optimized things the most for their uh for their jobs you know could win prizes and that a lot of different groups uh individuals or small groups that presented and it was a great way to take the, the all of the activity and all the learning from the individual people and kind of bring that to bear for the entire organization. So um, highly recommend that. Um, I think that we will be doing that internally uh, in our company. Okay, uh, so then uh, another poll, right? So now we're gonna get a chance to, uh, this is gonna be fun, right? Because I said, we're gonna talk a little bit about the kinds of things that we're all doing already uh, with AI, because you know, in, in our past experience, that's something people like to talk about, right? So this should be um, a good way to participate. So think about that. 
Um, so this is going to be uh, doubly fun because not only do we get to talk about our AI exploits, but we get to do a word cloud, which is everyone's favorite type of visualization, right? So in one or two words, all right? And we're saying one or two words because I want to get the effect of, of the big giant words if people are doing uh, similar things. So one or two words, describe your best uses of AI in your work. If we're allowed to participate, I didn't. I'm participating. I, I just assumed that we weren't allowed, so. I apologize. It doesn't know who I am. It doesn't like your word. Uh oh. Marketing. First draft. Writing code. Uh, Writing code is huge. Love to hear uh, who's using AI to write code. That would be uh, that'd be a great one to hear more about. Idea generator, yeah. Analyzing sure. copies good. You can ask it to summarize the grade level of this. That's a really fun one. You can also ask it to change the voice. So you can say, write this document for a kindergartner or write this document for a PhD. And you can take the same version of text or the same version of ad copy and write it for lots of different personas and voices and have it do that for you. That's pretty fun. Um, we also like one, which is, hey, explain this concept to a kindergartner or to a five-year-old. And it'll take something fairly complex like uh, a data warehouse and an ETL process, and it'll explain that in very simple language that's easy to understand. And then you can use that as a starting point. All right, um, cool. So this is uh, this gives us an idea, right? A lot of us are, are using it for marketing. Um, ideation, right? This idea of a first draft or or an idea uh, for something that we want to do. I want to invite anyone that um, uh, that's willing to do to go in the chat and just give us a little bit more detail on on exactly um, the kind of things you do. And I would expect, right? So these are some of the things I just made a list of things that I've heard that either you know our team is doing or that uh, others that we that we talked about. Um, are doing, and it's right, a lot of brainstorming, ideation, right? Those drafts, uh, content, translation. I, uh, see that occasionally, right? That's that's not a big one uh, for associations, but if you're, you know, but if you're global, right? You want to uh, launch uh, publications in different languages, or you have currency uh, trans, uh, uh, currency exchanges, things like that. Uh, a, a massive corpus of documentation or uh, the transcript of a really long meeting, summarize those key points and uh, and takeaways, right? Um, come up with an event uh, event itinerary, you know, based on uh, some parameters that you put in. Data analysis, right? Hey, analyze this data, right? That's, uh, uh, that's a good one. Sentiment analysis, topic modeling. Hey, uh, what was the, uh, what was the subject and the sentiment of all of these uh, phone calls, right? That came into our, uh, you know, customer service line. Chatbots, uh, yeah, I can use it for virtual assistants type things. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, I very rarely use uh, regular search anymore. Start with, uh, uh, you know, start with a, uh, you know, searching one of the LLM models and uh, go from there. That's usually uh, good enough uh, for me. So, uh, okay, creative and enticing presentation titles. To attract attention. Oh yeah, good. Uh, yeah, so this is the uh, 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 PRSA um, article. They're good. Thank you for for putting that, Michael. Appreciate that. Uh, all right, cool. So uh, keep that up, right? If there, if there's something else that you want to tell us about, uh, we'd be glad to hear about it. And while we're doing that, uh, we're going to go to um, our third. Thing that we think can make a big impact, which is your value proposition or your value proposition, proportion, uh, according to uh, this AI-generated uh, graphic. So the the prompt for this was something like, you know, show an image that that depicts value proposition for association uh, members, and it could show different products and services, including things like events and networking, thought leadership, learning, etc. And this is what uh, Dolly came up with, which I actually kind of like it, you know, the uh, um, the words aside, I think the uh, the overall look and feel and, and some of the 
individual images are uh, are kind of interesting. Uh, okay, yeah, cool. So uh, so everybody check out uh, what Michael's telling us about writing code. I will try not to be distracted by that while talking about uh, the rest of the stuff here. But we do have um, another uh, poll question. So grab your phones. And this one is, what's the main reason your association loses members? Don't know, coming in hot right off the bat. That's, they were, they were really sure they didn't know. Wouldn't it be great if you could text those people who forgot to renew and, and ask them a one simple question, do you plan on renewing this year? Reply yes, and then call them up and ask them to renew. I bet you could make a big dent in retention that way. Yeah. Going out of business or acquisition, that's a tough one. I think that one's hard to overcome. Yeah, I agree, right? Um, you know, some of us are in associations that are like the industry itself is declining. Um, and yeah, so membership is going to uh, decline in proportion, right? As a result of that. So sometimes it's not something that we can, um, that we can help. Okay, all right, so we still have some answers coming in. Um, a little over 20% of us said relevance, price. A lot of us don't know. Um, that's interesting, right? Um, if we don't know, then what should we do about that, Greg? Should we ask or should we observe, right? We, we could do both, but uh, that's an interesting one. We always ask people why, not always, but we very often ask why they joined. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how often we ask why they left. And if we do, I bet we don't get an answer to it very often. <laughs> I would uh, say it, it's a really good opportunity to ask them, but I would go back and observe what they did or didn't do, maybe with some sort of engagement score, and say, well, why did these people not renew? What level of engagement did they have beforehand? What of our value proposition were they participating in or not participating in, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, the, the, there, there's two things that, that come up pretty often, right? They left the industry or they retired, so somebody was just talking about that. Um, they forgot to renew, right? Um, M and A, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of like you lose track of them, right? It's not like they're 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 still in the industry. They're still probably maybe even with the member company, but you lost track of them, right? It'd be great to have their cell phone or their personal email address in that case, and then we could probably um, keep track of them a little bit better. But so, but then there's this big one, right? So uh, there's another reason that looks something like this, and uh, a lot of you sort of guess what this would be. And we called it relevance in the poll, but the real, you know, really what it is, it's lack of value clarity, right? And so that relates to your value proposition in a couple of ways, right? One is you just don't have very much value. And the other one could be that you're not communicating it effectively. So um, this is a slide we've used before. Um, this was done by Hellmeyer and it was a poll where they basically asked, you know, association executives, do you have a clear value proposition? And shockingly to me, only 54% said yes to that, that they did have it. Um, so 46% said they don't. And even more shocking, 22% said that they don't have it and they have no plans to create it, right? Don't care. Uh, you know, so uh, that's that's crazy to me. But uh, you know, the point here is that you need a clear and compelling value proposition and you need to communicate that uh, to your members. So um, Greg, tell us uh, just, I think we're all more or less clear, but let's... Uh, be explicit about this. What is a value proposition? Yeah, I think this was key as we were preparing for this part of our webinar. I was like, do we even know what a value proposition is? Is a value proposition the list of things on my website under why join? And it's like kind of, right? So uh, we love this definition of value proposition. It's the unique statement of the value an association offers to its members. And it's a promise of what you're going to receive if you join. Now, I think there's a key here is there needs to be a distinct wall between what the non-members get from us and what the members get from us. And this is where our value proposition comes in because we can ask some interesting questions. Is advocacy a value proposition? Well, non-members get the value of advocacy, right? Is that part of our value proposition? Sure it is. We advocate on behalf of the industry, but that doesn't necessarily separate member benefits from non-member benefits, right? 
The other part of this that gets a little murky is, you know, we have this resource center on our website and members can use that as a member benefit. I looked at the data and no one's using that as a member benefit. Is that part of your value proposition? Right. So when we think about our value proposition, what we really want to do is sharpen our pencil and start to define what are the unique things that members can do and receive that non-members can't do and can't receive. And how do we make it obvious to them that when you don't renew your membership, your member benefits stop? Right. What is that thing we're going to turn off that they're going to notice tomorrow that they're not getting anymore? Um, the water company has a huge advantage because when you don't pay your water bill, they turn it <laughs> off and you notice right away, right? This is very different from that gym membership. When you stop paying your bill, you can no longer get into the gym. I don't care. I haven't been there in months. Not a member benefit, right? So value proposition, I think, is one of those terms that we put extra things into or we put things into that aren't really tied to perceived member value or utilized member value ask yourself, are they really part of our value proposition or not? Yeah, great, great. Um, so at the bottom there, um, I put a QR code. And as I was uh, doing some research for this, um, I, I found this thing and it was done by the National Association of Realtors. And um, it's pretty awesome, I have to say. So they did something that they call a value proposition toolkit. And they talk about what a value proposition is. This is where we took this uh, definition, we talk about why it's important to communicate it. They go into steps about how you sort of um, solidify and what yours is in a way that's going to be easily um, uh, explainable, right? So that you can communicate it to your members in a um, in a unified way. So highly recommend um, that you uh, check that out. And there's uh, you can use the QR code on on the screen. All right. So we talked about what it is. Uh, tell us about why we should care about that. I mean. For me, everything goes back to the value proposition, right? If we don't have a clearly defined value proposition, how are we supposed to recruit members? How are we supposed to retain members? How do we know what programs and services we're supposed to focus on? For me, value proposition is the umbrella, the guiding point that helps focus all of our efforts and direct us to where we need to be, right? So when we ask ourselves, are we doing the things we need to do and are we spending resources on the things that are aligning with our value proposition or are we spending a lot of time doing things that have nothing to do with our value proposition? Are we getting stuck in shiny object syndrome? Hey, we're going to go spend 10% of our capacity, our time and our budget doing this thing that isn't broadly applicable to our members and isn't related to our value proposition, right? We're distracting ourselves from where we really need to be spending time. And I think this muddies the water with all of our downstream communications. Put yourself in the shoes of that marketing coordinator, write in the email, to encourage people to come to our big annual symposium, right? If they don't understand our value proposition and why we're doing this, then how are they really gonna be able to write that copy in that email to really focus on why these people need to do this thing, right? Okay. I also feel like with value proposition, we can have too many that don't really apply. And then we're sort of throwing pasta at the wall. Why should I renew with your association? Well, we provide these 900 member benefits, right? That's why you should renew with us. And it's like, I didn't even think I'd use most of those things. I don't think that applies to me. If you can say, look, we provide these three member benefits and you go, yeah, all three of those really resonate with me. That's why I'm renewing my membership with this association. That's where value proposition becomes a really strong tool. Great. Uh, thanks, Greg. So uh, we're going to wrap things up by getting back, kind of tying things back to analytics. And so it may not seem like uh, value proposition is something that's really related to analytics, but definitely it is. Uh, there is this idea of analytically driven uh, value, right? So you have all these touch points, you have a learning management system, you have uh, a community, you have events, things like that. Um, and you, with three integrations, you push that data to some kind of central repository. And that helps you start to answer questions like, who is it for, right? Who are these products and services for? Um, your members and the segments within that membership um, and what do they want or need, right? And it's you know, there's the idea of your your broader value proposition, of course, but then also, you know, there's some nuance to it because your association value prop resonates differently with different segments of your members, right? So we've talked about that before, um, but conceptually is enough, you know, for uh, for today. And then, of course, you have your mission and your purpose, which says who you are as an association. And very importantly, what do you do better or what are you best at to fulfill those wants and needs of your members, right? And so... Um, 
I was starting to struggle to, to come up with, uh, you know, with a good example, but it, you know, in the, the business seminars, I used to talk about like Southwest airlines very much. And they'd say, well, you know, there's a lot of airlines, but Southwest, their value proposition is, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, low cost and they're low friction. Right. So, um, so they really focus on, on that, that aspect of the experience versus like, you know, um, luxury or, you know, or, or a lot of perks and things like that. Right. So there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, um, airlines that offer, you know, the broadly these services, but they're going to focus on certain things that they can really be, uh, best at. Right. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, and then your analysis of all of those things kind of informs the actions that you should take to improve your products and services. Right. So I'm showing this kind of flat, you know, but really this is something that's uh, circular, right? So you have your data collection, that informs your value proposition and the way that your members and customers interact with those products and services that make up your value kind of informs the changes that you should make. And if only there was a good way to measure and take action, all that um, good news for all of us is there is, it's called the engagement model, right? The donut. And that is what represents and what reflects your value proposition, right? So it includes activities and includes weights and how the engagement scores and the composition of your scores change over time is a very good um, representation of, uh, am I effectively communicating my value proposition and how does it resonate with different uh, segments of your audience, all right? Uh, so uh, that about wraps it up, but you know, as we were talking about this, you know, we had only three, there's a couple of uh, bonus tips that will uh, that will throw in there. Uh, so if you want to make a big impact, uh, one of the things that you could do is consider uh, allowing your members to auto renew. So it's we haven't done a, a broad study in this, but we have lots of anecdotal uh, data points that uh, suggest that this makes a massive uh, impact in your retention, uh, in particular in uh, in certain segments. It's pretty easy to do. If you're not at least offering that, highly recommend you do that. It doesn't take a lot of effort and it's going to pay big dividends. Uh, the other one is, is personal Bill, outreach. somebody once asked me about auto renewals. Yeah. And they said they added a checkbox to the renewal form and asked people if they wanted to enroll in auto renewals and almost nobody checked the box. And I said, why don't you just check that by default? So if you're going to offer auto renewals, don't make it an opt-in, make it an opt-out. Hey, we're putting you an auto renewal this year because we think it's the best thing for you. And if you don't want that, uncheck this box. Yeah. You're going to have a much better call, a uh, much better success on that than if you ask people to intentionally opt in for that program. Yeah, it's for your convenience, right? We're opting you into it, but if you don't want it for some reason, let us know. Um, personal outreach. Um, so if this is maybe more for trades than others, but if you have high value members that you can't afford to lose, uh, you know, don't blast them, you know, uh, unpersonalized uh, emails. Uh, you need a, a high touch, highly personal type of experience. And if you can do anything to personalize, and when I say personalize, I don't mean like a segmented email. I mean like a phone call or a personal meeting um, that helps with onboarding or with retention in some cases, right? So I understand that that doesn't scale very well, but uh, in certain cases, it can make uh, a big impact. Uh, Last one, and I'll turn it over to Greg, is learn about GA4, right? GA4 is relatively new this year. It's it's easy to configure and easy to get a good understanding of the types of conversions that are taking place on your website. Uh, our experience is that most associations are not spending the time to learn about that and to set it up uh, effectively. Um, if you just spent a couple of hours in free training on GA4, I bet you could make a big impact on your understanding of your website visitors which would probably um, lead to more of all the things that you want, right? Registrations and member joins and, and purchases and all of that. All right, take us home, Greg. Mine fall into two categories. The first one um, is create space for curiosity. Encourage curiosity within your team, ask them questions and encourage them to test things and learn things. We're not gonna get it right every time, right? But if we get it right more than not, we're doing better than we were without. Um, I, I often find that just allowing for curiosity isn't enough. It's, it's encouraging and creating space for curiosity, encouraging people to do things and test things out um, that may or may not work out is key. The second thing I want to talk about is getting the big rocks in first. So one of the first management courses I took, they put a big glass cylinder on the table. 
And they said, we have to get all of these rocks, pebbles, and sand in this glass cylinder. What's the best way to do that? Um, and, and they did it wrong the first time. They poured all the sand in, and it, it took up the bottom. And then they poured the pebbles in, and it took up the middle. And there were no room for those big rocks to go in because they couldn't fit. So we did it again. First, we put the big rocks in, and they fit nicely in the cylinder. Then we poured the sand in and shook it, and it fell in between all the rocks. And then we put the pebbles in and shook it, and it fell in there as well. And, and this is how we want you to approach your strategic planning. What are the big rocks? What are the five or six things that we have to get right and we have to do really well? And let's spend more time and effort making sure those big rocks get put in place than all the little sand and pebbles. And this is where we can sort of cut some dead weight, right? Is all that sand really necessary? Are those really member benefits that go back to our unique value proposition? Are those really questions on the join form that matter that we're using for actual purposes? Or does that dead weight just slow us down and just hinder us? This is a great time to free yourself from the dead weight as we're moving into the new year, new fresh start, new you, cut some of that dead weight, take some of those things that aren't related to your value proposition that don't have direct outcomes that you're using, just stop doing that stuff. All right, awesome. Thanks, Greg. Thanks everyone for your participation. Uh, great conversation as usual. Here are a couple of resources um, that might be interesting to you. This is our Dirty Data uh, webinar uh, that we did a few months back. And, or that was actually a blog, sorry. And here's a webinar where we talked about uh, our uh, value management, right? So this was all about uh, the maintain, building and maintaining your uh, value proposition. So uh, take a look at those. And again, thanks for your participation and for finding all of the errors in our AI generated uh, images. So uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks again, and I uh, look forward to seeing you next year.